Hi, my name is Barrett Fallbush, and I'm the senior minister here at Old Union Christian Church, and thank you for joining us on our online revival. I didn't think that I was going to have to step in, but indeed, we had some preachers uh, drop out uh, for, for good reasons. But uh, so I thought I would fill in, and I thought I'd bring the word for you this evening, and I thought that you would enjoy this. So before we hop to it, let's go to God in prayer. Abba, Father, may the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you in your sight. May your word accomplish what it wills and have a transforming effect to harden or soften the heart of the person who's listening to the sound of the voice that you've given me. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the mercy in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Clement of Rome a disciple of Peter wrote, the master, brothers, has no need of anything at all. He requires nothing of anyone except to make a confession to him. I have a confession to make. I confess that Jesus, the Messiah, is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I confess Jesus is the one who paid my penalty for my sin debt. I confess that I have transgressed against the law in every conceivable way. I've struggled in a lot of areas in my life. I'm a certified expert of sin, and I'm a preacher, which is kind of funny. Uh, some people call me their pastor. I really wish they wouldn't because I don't meet the qualification to shepherd over their souls, but. More or less, I'm a teacher, and I talk a lot when I teach because I have so much experience in doing the wrong thing that I just want to use all the examples I know myself guilty of. And worst of all, I'm a recovering egomaniac, which makes being the center of attention pretty difficult for me at times. Now, I, all of this I say not to be self-deprecating for sympathy's sake. I tell you this because I wanted you to know that I've struggled with a lot of things in my life. And if I were to tell you the depths of what I've struggled with, it would probably make you vomit. But the greatest struggle that I've known in my life at this time has been against pornography and masturbation. It stemmed from how I grew up. Looking back, I, I felt as though I was maligned and twisted as a child. My memory doesn't allow me to remember if something actually really bad happened or whether or not it was a figment of my imagination. Now, there were a lot of horrible things that happened to me, no doubt, and it warped and it twisted a lot of my senses and realities and how I understood life and living, but specifically, it warped my sense of sexuality. And I grew up into this closet sexual deviant now, I'm not blaming anyone. Anyone who has ever done me wrong has been forgiven of their sin against me because I hold no record of wrong against anyone who's indebted to me in the past, in the present, or in the future. I hold no one's sin against them, and I pronounce condemnation on no one because Christ doesn't condemn me. I tell you all this not to be self-deprecating for sympathy's sake, I tell you this because I have found in my own reading of the Bible that the longer a soul suffered, the greater the relief the soul experienced in the miracle of deliverance and the more praise had been given to God. I want to read for you some lines that are found in a letter that was written by somebody who knew Jesus personally and he writes to a culture that's a lot like our culture today. Paul writes to the Christian church in Rome. See if you can relate to this. Romans chapter 7, beginning with uh, verse 14. The New Living Translation reads, The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. 
And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, my old sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing it. It is the sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all of my heart, but there is another power within me that's waging war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Do you feel what Paul is talking about? Because I sure do. I felt as though even though I had submitted myself to God in my belief in him and my confession of his son and in my baptism, even though I'd offered all of my life and my body and I said, Lord Jesus, do what you want to with me. I found out and I'd realized through some painful lessons that I was still a slave to sin, specifically pornography. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If the spirit of Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Do you know how I know that the Spirit of God lives in me? Because I no longer struggle with pornography and masturbation. I had been looking at porn since I was nine years old. And when I decided to make Jesus Christ my Lord, I was 15 years old. And when I was 15, God bless his soul, Mark Mobley, my youth minister, came into my room and he saw about 15 posters on the wall of just half-naked women that you buy at Spencer's because I was that guy and his eyes must have just gotten this big when he looked around and was just like uh, yeah this is gonna have to go and it was at that moment that I realized my sin of cultivating unbridled lustful imagination for the opposite sex it was revealed and every day I felt shameful and dirty, and I couldn't stop the course I had begun. But little by little, I'm ashamed to say I grew accustomed of the feeling that would follow after I turned off the computer each night. I remember thinking to myself, when I get to Bible college, I'm not gonna struggle with this anymore. And then I got to Bible college and I still struggled with it. And then when I was in Bible college, I thought to myself, surely when I become a minister, I won't struggle with pornography anymore. And I became a minister and I still struggled with pornography. And I thought to myself, maybe if I'm just married, once I get married, I won't struggle with pornography any longer. And I continued to struggle with pornography. You see how it really resonates with me what Paul is saying here, that I really don't understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. When my first child was born and I still struggle with pornography, I went to and started going to SAA meetings. And I heard about men who struggled with the most filthiest and vile of sins. And I thought to myself, I don't belong here. But I did, because that's 
who I was. I was just as sexually guilty as any one of them and may not have played it out in real life, but in my head, I've probably thought about it a hundred different ways. No matter how hard I prayed, no matter what I tried to do, nothing seemed to work and I desperately cried out to God to ease my burden. And then one day, Jesus, like a thief, in the night after years of begging, he came into my heart as if it had been a dark and empty home. And he started flipping on the light switches to reveal what was there. It was a very interesting time for me in my life. And I remember talking and sharing with him thinking, Jesus, why did I have to struggle with the nastiest and the most sinful of things for so long? And one of the things that I remember him sharing with me during that time was so that he could demonstrate for me his power and his effectiveness of removing sin and how gracious and how patient and how loving he had been with me throughout all my years of struggle. And then I remembered a scripture that came into my mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where Paul reflects on his own personal issues when he prayed to the Lord three times to have God remove something from him. And then Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. I carried around this self-medicating escape of pornography for 23 years until one day, I can't even tell you the day, I can't even tell you the week where Jesus came into my heart and robbed me of it. It's like he whispered into my life, we're done with that. And it was done, it was gone, and I had been freed. Months had gone by at this point, and I walked into my office and I saw my computer lying there and I remember a distinct challenging voice and it said, I bet you won't throw that computer away. And I said in a very audible voice, I bet you I will. And I took that computer, however expensive it was, and I threw it in the dumpster. And ever since then, I've been pornography free and sober. Now I tell you all of this, not to be self-deprecating for sympathy's sakes, but to reveal to you that I know that Jesus is real and alive today because his Holy Spirit lives inside of me, growing me and shaping me more into the image, into the likeness of his son. Romans chapter eight, verse 11, we read it earlier, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I belong to Christ. And I know all power and authority have been handed over to him because once I was a lying, manipulating, self-absorbed deviant. And now by the grace of God, I am not. God saved me by his grace. And I'm here to tell you today that if God is capable of raising Jesus Christ from the dead, and if he's capable of saving a sinner like me, he's capable of saving and rescuing you from anything, including sin, death, and hell. The great God of the universe, the only God, the maker of all things, sent his son Jesus to die upon the cross for the world. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, For I determine to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul writes again to the church of Galatia, But may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul could have boasted in any number of things. Paul could have boasted in the preeminence of Christ, the fact that Christ has always been there before creation. He could have boasted in the miraculous virgin birth. He could have boasted in Christ's teachings, who the teachers of the world today still agree Jesus is the greatest teacher. 
He could have boasted in the miracles of Christ or the resurrection of Christ from the dead. He could have preached in his second coming and he's coming again, but he didn't. He preached and boasted in the cross. Paul says out of all these things, he boasts in the cross. The cross? That ancient crucifixion device? That ancient torture device? The electric chair of their day? He boasts in that? The cross is what every Christian agrees upon. Every Christian, no matter the denomination, no matter what language or region or what Bible they read or what color their skin is, every single Christian agrees that Jesus was nailed to the cross, that he was buried in the ground, and that he resurrected. The cross is central to Christianity. Why? Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul writes and tells that through the cross, God reconciled all things to Jesus because he bled and died on it. One of Jesus' disciples named Peter wrote, and he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. Stay with me, internet audience, as I read Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. This is amazing. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we had done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Many of you all can see this world right now in the position that it's in. Many of you are fearful of your lives and you don't know what's gonna happen after you die. You've not been challenged with death like what a pandemic brings about. I get it. But I'm here to tell you that if you haven't made Jesus your Lord and your Savior, you have no hope for eternal life, the Bible says. There is no other name under heaven that is given to men by which men can be saved, the Bible says, other than the name of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The gospel or the good news that Jesus came preaching is that God reigns. The great God of the universe, the great God of creation, the only God who sits upon the throne, he is the most merciful, most good, most just being you could ever want in that position. The great God of the universe must punish sin and rebellion. He must allow people the opportunity to freely choose or freely reject him. The gospel that is able to save your souls to all who would hear and believe is that Jesus died upon the cross according to the scriptures, that he was buried according to the scriptures, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures as a propitiation for our sins. He ascended to heaven at the right hand of God and now lives forevermore to make atonement, to intercede for us between us and the Father. He was a propitiation, an offering that turns away the wrath of God. Hallelujah. The great God of the universe must punish sin and rebellion, and he must allow people that opportunity to choose him freely or reject him. And there's only two options. Either you can pay for your sin in hell for all eternity, which is where and what we deserve, or you can accept the free gift, which is grace given to us as a free gift by God. Paul says, you've been saved by grace 
through your faith, which is your confidence in the truth that Jesus is who he says he is and has done what he said he would do. But there is a moment in which the sinner goes from sinner to saved. A moment in which the sinner's soul is crucified with Christ. The Bible says that you have been crucified with Christ. You've been saved by grace through faith, Paul says. And I like what one of my professors, Dr. Jack Cottrell says. He combines Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 with Ephesians 2, 4 and says that a Christian is saved by grace through faith in baptism for good works. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the work of God who raised Christ from the dead. And I love the next verse, verse 13, when you were dead in your transgressions, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, he has taken it away, having nailed it to the cross. Peter stood up and, and preached a sermon to the very Jews who realized that they crucified the Son of God and they were distraught and they were cut to the heart like you would be if you had just nailed the Son of God to a tree. And they said, brothers, what must we do to be saved? And Peter stood up and replied to them all, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and all those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God would call to himself. Have you confessed Jesus as the master of your life? Have you confessed him as the savior from your sin? Have you repented, which means to reconsider how you're living your life right now for the opportunity to be joined together with the God of the universe through Christ Jesus? Repentance means to change your mind, to rethink about the proposition would you change your mind? Would you repent of your sin? If you're in sin right now, would you turn the other way towards God? Have you been plunged in the waters of baptism? It's not a work that you do yourself. It's a work that somebody else agrees to do for you. Because if you haven't, the Bible says. A Christless eternity awaits. Repent and be saved and turn your minds and your hearts to Christ. Search and seek him through prayer, the Bible, and your local church. And if you need us, we're here for you. To Jesus Christ, the Son, to God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. Amen. Don't none go away.